Hi everyone. Um, yeah, um, so welcome to this uh, event. Thank you for so many of you coming. Um, to, this is going to be a crash course history on the history of the disabled people's movement in uh, Ireland and also, in the, and far more interestingly, in the United Kingdom uh, with my two great guests, uh, Joe Crawshaw and uh, Dennis Queen. Um, Joe will be briefly take, talking about, uh, we'll be talking about Dan uh, or the Disability Action Network in the United Kingdom and uh, uh, Dennis will be focusing on disability, the history of disability arts and a little about uh, disability activism in Manchester. Um, I am going to start with a, um, um, about, um, just, just to set the scene and give the Irish perspective. Um, I am just going to briefly share the agenda up here so everybody knows what the evening is going to basically look like um, from um, yeah um, yeah so um, yeah so as you can see we're going to have three speakers we're going to have a 10 minute break and then we are going to have a conversation between uh, us three panelists for 20 minutes. And then the last half hour, you are going to have a chance to answer, to ask questions for all of us. You can put them in the chat during the evening, or you can uh, raise your hand right, uh, at the right time. Um, at, uh, Jerry, at, or you could raise your hand when it comes to the appropriate time for the Q&A. So I will be chairing. So without further ado, I'm going to start with the disability history of Ireland. Okay, so the first thing to see... The first thing to say about the disabled people's movement in Ireland is it's relatively new. I mean, um, at least in comparison to the UK one. So we don't have the same... Um, level of history, but that's because Ireland is still a relatively new state in comparison. So, uh, I mean, you, when you talk about the history of disability in Ireland, you kind of have to do a lot of guesswork around the edges. It's kind of annoying. So, I mean, you could look back at the colonial period. Um, there was stuff like the poor laws, which were introduced in England in um, 1601, they didn't apply to Ireland, but they kind of had the first written legal code of differentiating some types of people with impairments, such as the blind and the, um, the lame, I believe. King, I think George, uh, one of them, I don't know, I don't know how many Georges there were, I think it was the, the one who had, yeah, King George III, I think, or George II, it doesn't matter, <laughs> in the 17th, in the 18th century, passed, um, extensive laws that effective went throughout the entire um, United Kingdom. Ireland was not actually part of the United Kingdom at that stage, but it was still kind of loosely controlled by the British state. And they kind of prescribed that the indolent poor should be put in like houses of correction. And that included the, some disabled people or so they were just supplanted into workhouses or institutions. Um, I believe that act was like the 1760s or the 1770s. Fast forwarding again, yeah, it's, um, we get record when Ireland was fully incorporated into the United Kingdom in 1801. Uh, so yeah, but it, during the famine, the, the, the infamous Irish famine, there were um, able-bodied Irish citizens were prioritized for uh, famine relief. Um, they, not that they, themselves got a lot, but they were given but what little Charles Trevelyan, the uh, the administrator who was in charge of the famine relief, decided to give was given to Ireland. It was given to the so it was given to the able bodied member. And so disabled people were often turned away when they showed up to get to claim uh, basic food or um, packages. So uh uh, you then have kind of, I guess you can see, you can see individual store, um, probably the most famous two people, uh, not in the, from the 19th century, to rewind a bit into the 18th century, 
there were two um, very famous disabled Irish individuals. One was called Charles O'Brien. He was uh, the so-called Irish giant. He had a giant. He had he had large bones. He actually had a brain tumor that eventually killed him. But he was basically he basically hired himself out as an entertainer. Um, and despite his wishes, he wanted he wanted to be buried at sea, but he was actually put in, um, in the British Museum. Uh, his skeleton was put in the British Museum. I think it was re- removed only recently. Actually, the other figure was a serial killer who was actually uh, paralysed from the waist down, called Billy, or Billy in the Bowl. It's actually debatable whether he existed. The evidence on it is. Um, vague, though there seems to be a register of his death, so he may have existed, but he um, apparently begged people for, he he moved about by in a bowl, hence the name, really in the bowl, using chains to drag it, and he would uh, rob people uh, and murder his victims because he was too conspicuous. Um, a robber, so he ended up having to kill them. So you could kind of see from stories like that, maybe tropes around disability, such as the evil cripple when it comes to Billy, or the um, or the kind of the other, the circus freak um, when it comes to Charles O'Brien, um, who uh, kind of foreshadows what happens to 19th century uh, so-called freaks uh, with stuff like P.T. Barnum. Uh, anyway, fast forwarding to the independence of Ireland in 1922. Uh, the Irish administration, the free state that took over, didn't really bother to change a lot of British uh, colonial laws at first. So there was st- so um, uh, so in 1921, for instance, there was um, the, one, the future Prime Minister, William Cosgrave, um, basically was complaining to like the Home Secretary that people, including the dis- orphans, especially the disabled and uh, the destitute, he wished that they would emigrate so that the state wouldn't have to take care of them. Um, so that was kind of the mentality the state approached them with. Uh, our, Ireland was not kind of unique in this regard. We had institutions, disabled people were imprisoned. I guess the only thing that made Ireland more unique was ours was controlled by uh, the Catholic Church. Um, It led to infamous, horrible atrocities such as the Magdalene laundries and the mother and baby homes um, where 796 children died and their bodies were dumped down a septic tank which, um, yeah, um, <laughs> that, we, uh, um, in two, that was only in one home in two in County Galway. But um, again, I said you have to do, I think at the beginning, I said you have to do guesswork in Ireland. This is true because you can't, a lot of, the, a lot of historians just don't bother to talk about disability, even the even fairly uh, accurate social historians. So you kind of have to read between the lines of what they're actually saying. So for instance, I would argue at least half the population of Ireland was in a way disabled. But for most of the 20th century, I am, of course, talking about women who were basically relegated to second class citizens. Their um, contraception was initially legal in Ireland after the after the British left, but it was banned in 1938. There was an attempt to legalise it again by the minister for by the socialist minister for health, Dr. Noel Brown, in 1940. So 1951, um, he himself was disabled. I think he was deaf, but he anyway he was sacked from the government by the, because the Archbishop of Ireland um, at the time told him to basic uh, basically called up the government to say this you can't legalize contraception, so because it's a communist plot. Anyway, so yeah, you have to guess um, a lot of things like that. Uh, we, when it comes to the independent living movement itself, um, that doesn't really start to happen until late 80s, early 90s. Martin Nocton founded the, in the a man named Martin Nocton, who was unfortunately dead, um, founded the uh, what the, center of, the first centre of independent living movement 
just independent living in uh, Dublin in 1992. Before that, he was also involved with the founding of the European Network on Independent Living in 1989. Um, so, yeah, the so the uh, it was so there are over twenty uh, centres of independent living now in Ireland. Um, as I said, we haven't we don't have the same history, uh, longevity as the US or UK. Um, but we are fighting on um from such as personal assistance. Um, um, yeah, and uh. <laughs> employment, um, uh, special, special education. Uh, I mean, the, the struggles are quite similar to other countries, but I guess the, I guess the difference is that it's just more recent in our time. There has been some improvements, like the Disability Act from 2005, which says that at least some public bodies have an um, obligation to not discriminate against disabled people, and there are nominal quotas for disabled people, at least in the civil service. That's not always clear if they're actually acted upon. Um, so yeah, um, Ireland signed the UNCRPD embarrassingly late after everyone else in Europe um, in 2018, but we have not ratified the optional protocol um, because apparently, according to the government, the time is not right. I don't know when the time is right, but uh, apparently not now. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, so to conclude, uh, you are a bit, yeah, you have to read between the lines. Um, I would, as I said, I would say that a large part of the population of Ireland was disabled as w women were not basically allowed to do anything except stay more or less at home, um, according to the constitution that was written in 1937. So, uh, so for most of the 20th century, I would say a large parts of the population were disabled. Then, of course, you have direct discrimination against disabled people during the famine. That was the colonial period. You have kind of nebulous figures like Charles O'Brien and uh, Billy in the Bowl, um, who might point towards kind of archetypes of how both Irish and English people viewed uh, disability at the time. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, this is probably this is far from extensive, um, and it, and of course you have institutions like everywhere else. The probably the only real kind of difference is that Ireland's were all controlled by Catholic priests, um, so the majority of the people locked in the institutions were women and children who were considered fallen women. Obviously, we don't know the percentages of those who were actually disabled, though a lot of people in those institutions is, were exposed to diseases like tuberculosis. It's also worth pointing out. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Ireland is still kind of growing. Ireland is a very young country. And as a consequence of that, our disabled people's movement is young. Um, and as I said, it were generally overlooked by Irish historians. But, um, yeah. Um, okay, uh, that's enough for me. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I'm going to pass you on to... Uh, Joe Crawshaw now. Uh, so take it away, Joe. I'm just unmuting. Hello, everybody. Hi, Hi my name's Jill. Um, I'm coming to you from Leeds, and uh, thank you for, for having me. Um, yeah, and I'm just going to describe myself as much for the description as to point out that I've been around a while. Um, I'm a woman in her 60s uh, with grey hair. I've got little round glasses on and I'm sitting in a little box room here. Um, but yes, although I've been, I've been around for a while, I'm maybe not going to go as far back in history as Pad has just been. I'm going to talk about a specific bit of the disabled people's movement in the UK, and that's uh, the Disabled People's Direct Action Network. Um, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute. I was just struck though um, to hear you say, Pada, that you know the movement in Ireland hasn't got the history maybe that the UK has or the US has, um, but nonetheless there's 20 centres for independent living, which sounds actually sounds pretty good going. I don't know how many there are here in England even, I don't know. Um, yeah, but it, it must be comparable really. 
because some have shut down, some have fallen out of control by disabled people and become something else, really. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, yeah, don't worry about that too much. It's what's happening now and where you're going from now, of course. OK, then I'm going to talk about DAM and I'm going to call it DAM, which is short for the Direct Action Network, which is short for the Disabled People's Direct Action Network. Um, and that was and still is um, a national network of disabled people who use tactics, um, including blocking roads, occupying buildings, handcuffing themselves to public transport, whether that was buses or trains, um, and sometimes handcuffing themselves, ourselves to people. And that was all in the fight for equal rights and freedom for disabled people. Um, Dan's targets included public transport companies. They also included charities, local authorities, government and politicians, local and national politicians. And those were reflecting the demands of the wider disabled people's movement because Dan, of course, was a part of that disabled people's movement. Now, Dan was formed in 1993 and it, it came about following a huge demonstration in London, um, which was called Block Telethon, where thousands of disabled people came from around the country to protest outside ITV's telethon fundraiser that used to get um, broadcast every other year, I think. Um, yeah, so that, that was how it started. A lot of disabled people came together because they were angry about charity and maybe, you know, we'll come back to that perhaps in a bit. Um, and I went to that demo. I went to, there, was a, there were two demos, in fact, in London against Telethon. Um, because at that time, I think it was like, you know, charities were a real target for disabled people, the disabled people's movement. There was something we, the, that we were really protesting against, not only in terms of how they portrayed disabled people as dependent, as needy, as in need of charity, but also because they weren't controlled by disabled people, yet they used to speak for disabled people. So yeah, charities were, were you know, yeah, a real enemy of the disabled people's movement. Um, and as I say, from that, um, Dan sprang and I was one of the people who was around at the formation of Dan, um, uh, which happened, we got together in a meeting in 1993. Um, we were set up specifically to take direct action. So I think what happened was that, you know, there was a couple of key people and I don't know whether anybody's seen it, um, in either, whether you've seen them, Barbara Met Allen um, on the television, the TV doc, the drama documentary. Um, it is gonna be on Netflix as well before too long. Um, but there were a couple of people who were really pivotal to setting off down and that was Barbara Lissick and Alan Holdsworth in London. And, um, you know, I think they, really had this vision for some sort of national network and pulled together a set of people from around the country to this meeting and a set of people who wanted to take direct action. That was specifically um, what we wanted Dan to do. It wasn't just, yeah, it wasn't going to provide services. It wasn't going to be polite and go and write letters. It was about taking direct action. So, because it, it was a group of people who thought that's really what the disabled people's movement needed at that point. And that was because we were learning from other liberation movements and we were seeing how effective direct action can be. And when I say direct action, I should say that what that means is non-violent civil disobedience. Um, so that's people being prepared to break the law, preparing to get arrested, not necessarily getting arrested. I, I, I never like getting arrested. I would try not to be arrested if possible, but still be doing the actions. But yes, we were prepared to get arrested. Um, and actions were confrontational. They were supposed to be confrontational. Um, they were taking our demands because we were demanding things. We weren't just asking, we were demanding. We were taking out those demands directly to our targets, directly to the public as well. And so, you know, we were being really in your face about it. 
and yeah, we wanted to get, as I say, we really wanted to get good press coverage as well. And we found that direct action was pretty good for that as well. As I say, Dan was part of a wider disabled people's movement that had sort of, I guess, you know, mainly developed from the 70s through to the 90s and when I talk about the disabled people's movement in the UK I'm talking about representative organisations of disabled people not organisations that work in for but organisations that were controlled by that were made up of disabled people where disabled people were making all the decisions were in control of those organisations and those were you know a, a, were developing around the country so there was a network of those and you know there was an organization that's an umbrella organization that brought all those together which at the time was called the British Council of Organizations of Disabled People. Now Dan wasn't a member of that we were sort of this this <laughs> what you call it from a sort of the fringe there but we did link into BCODP but we weren't interested in doing the negotiations that was it was good partnership to have because they could do some of that work really I'm just going to flick about through my notes so I don't get too bogged down in things so yeah yeah as I say when we set up um yeah, we were all there. We were, I think, committed, whether we'd had experience of that or not, we were committed to direct action. Some of us did have experience of that, but not everybody did. Um, and so we were sort of deciding, even from that first meeting, whether we should have a wider civil rights campaign or whether we should focus, really focus on one issue and what would be more effective. And we decided that our focus at first would be public transport because at that time in the early 90s it was a disaster I'm not saying it's great now but it was a disaster then there was you know were there any I think possibly no accessible buses at all um, in the country and you know uh, yeah trains you had to book in advance P you know people got forgotten about all the time the guys had to get the ramps out they didn't want to people got left on the uh, yeah inaccessible stations all over the place so it was a disaster so we decided to focus on public transport and I think um and that wasn't to the exclusion of everything else. There were other, there were other actions as well. Um, but just doing that, I think, was quite, it worked out quite well and it was quite effective. It was something that I think the public had sympathy for at that time. You know, they did, a lot of people did think it was outrageous that disabled people really couldn't travel around. And yeah, the first public action though that Dan did wasn't around public transport. It was around a by-election, um, yeah, who had, you know, there was um, a candidate in Christchurch down south, which, you know, who had protested any disability legislation coming in. Remember, as I say, this was before the Disability Discrimination Act came in. That came in, in was passed in 1994 and started being enacted in sections from 1995. So we didn't have any civil rights legislation of any sort. Again, you might not know the ins and outs of the Disability Discrimination Act, and you might not call it civil rights legislation. And that's a whole other story really that maybe we'll touch on. Um, so as I say, Dan was this network of people around the country um, and we had contacts in different places. So I was one of the contacts for Yorkshire where I'm based. Um, and there were, yeah, there was people who, yeah, we communicated regularly, we would have meetings regularly, but as well that we would have both national actions, and oftentimes the national actions were in London, because obviously that's where Parliament is, but sometimes national actions were in other places as well. I'll tell you about a good one that was in Leeds, um, and, but we were also sort of given that those contacts in the different areas were given that a bit of a responsibility to try and organize local actions as well and crikey over the years I mean I don't know how yeah yeah in you know we were having actions all the blooming time we used to do two national actions a year at the height of Dan and then there was local actions as well that were happening in different parts of the country that often people would travel to to support those actions particularly if it was relatively nearby but honestly people would travel 
the length and breadth of the country to those actions. When we had a national action, that would tend to be over two or three days. So people would go and they would stay places. And generally as well, a lot of the, that meant accessible hotels because you know when there were cheap hotels the accessible hotel tended to be at the more expensive end so people were shelling out quite a bit or we were trying to fundraise to get people to actions so yeah I mean we had I don't know you know around 60 actions I think in in you know about 10 years um at that sort of peak of things that were just going on all the time um yeah so I just said I was going to tell you a bit about one in uh, Leeds because that's where I'm based and somebody must give me a 10 minute warning I forgot to say that <laughs> give me a 10 minute warning otherwise I'll go on and on with these stories of actions um yeah but in in Leeds um yeah we were going to hold an action anyway and then you know it's like oh yeah it'd be a good one it'd be a good one for a national action and we were going to um protest on Leeds train station about the general lack of access to trains and about the problems of booking and how unfair and unequal that was and what a desperate state of affairs it was. And we found out that um, British Rail, who used to run the trains and the railway stations at the time, uh, that British Rail were planning to build a, what they called a garden for the disabled on one of the on one of the ends of one of the platforms on Leeds station and they were going to spend I don't know you know tens of thousands of pounds on it um, and it was just like this is just an absolute insult because what people disabled people are supposed to go and sit in this garden for the disabled on the end of the platform and watch the trains go by that they can't get on you know what on earth would be thinking about so many of the platforms at that time weren't accessible to get to different platforms you had to use the goods lift and there weren't passenger lifts at that time so it was an absolute insult that they were spending this money on this and then so to you know we were going to go on we were going to do what Dan did very often which we called it catching a bus or catching a train and what that meant was handcuffing ourselves to it stopping it catching it that way if it was a bus people would be in front of it on the road if it was a train we'd get into the doors as best people could do that and some people handcuff themselves to it and stop the train setting off and that's what we we're planning to do and then um we found out that the Garden for the Disabled was going to be opened by none other than Jimmy Savile himself. Now, I'm just going to mention if people don't know who Jimmy Savile is, because I know you're, you'll be younger people as well. And yeah, I mean, Jimmy Savile was just, you know, an absolute um, very famous present, television presenter and DJ. He spent a lot of his time raising loads of money, including for disabled people. He raised a lot of money. Um, and this was all like part of his smoke screen because he was an absolute serial abuser throughout his life, sexual abuser of men, women, children, including disabled people. So where anyway, once we heard that Jimmy Savile for peace sake was gonna be over in this garden for the disabled, then we knew we had to have the action. Um, and that, yeah, and that, uh, so of course, you know, there was an opening ceremony. We found out when that was through, you know, through contacts here and everywhere, found out when that was and were able to, um, you know, just completely disrupt that, um, you know, in the press. It said how sudden Jimmy was and, you know, why don't people understand I'm just trying to do good for you, um, that sort of thing. Yeah, so once we'd done that, yeah, disrupted that opening ceremony. Then we moved on to catching a train, held up the train to London for at least half an hour. Nobody was arrested, so everybody was on the high. We went out into the street and caught a couple of buses as well for good measure and held up the traffic in the centre. So that was just one example of an action, the sort of things that we got up to. Um, but yeah, I think it was, it was, yeah, pretty effective. Um, yeah. I mean, the reasons why I must have done 10 minutes now, so I'm just going to sort of try and quickly wrap up. Um, 
yeah, I think, you know, the important thing to remember is that, you know, it, we weren't just doing it, doing taking direct action out of badness. Um, we knew it was effective. As I say, we'd seen what happened with other liberation movements around the world and how direct action can really be a tipping point or, you know, can really push an issue on. It might be a difficult point, but, you know, it's, it's really good for bringing things to a head, I think, sometimes. Um, but it's an effective way of getting the message across, an effective way of getting your message straight to your target without having to write letters or without having to go through the council or any other intermediary. Um, and it's an effective way of letting members of the public know what you think and what you're angry about and what you want to change. Um, it's it's inspiring, I think, for other disabled people. This is what people have said. Yeah, I'll wrap up. Yeah, seeing seeing those sorts of actions on television, people are thinking, blimey, you know, yeah, yeah. I can be doing this and disabled people are strong, angry and are changing things. Um, I said, yeah, yeah. It got all the support for the cause wider than that. It was definitely empowering for the people that took part, particularly. Many people would say that, absolutely empowering. And it overturned some of those stereotypes that I talked about earlier when I was mentioning charity. It overturned some of those stereotypes of disabled people as passive, as dependent, as not able to do anything. And it showed us being active and strong and bringing about change and being, you know, and having a coherent argument and all of those things. So, yeah. It wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just a bit of a laugh and it wasn't, it wasn't that, it was difficult and it was stressful sometimes. Um, but yeah, it was really effective and that's why we do it. And I think it was, and I think you can't say in a, in a movement that, you know, things changed, the disability discrimination act came in because of damn heaven knows. We don't want me to say that because it's a rubbish act. But I think, you know, that debate and the fact that we did get some legislation I think down that had a massive influence because we were very out there, we were very in the face, we were on television, in the papers. And I think people saw that. And of course, politicians saw that as well. And so I think, you know, I really think it did have an effect. So, yeah, that's probably enough from me. Thank you. Sorry if I ran over. But, you know, chance for questions later. OK, thank you. Uh, no, thank you, Jill. That was great. I kind of ran over to begin with, with my talk, so I kind of what would be a bit uh, hypocritical to, um, to interrupt. So, um, yeah, Dennis, you can have, I think since the photo of us ran over, you can, you can have a few extra minutes as well. Um, and also, I mean, we can, we can kind of con come back to stuff as well during the conversation part. So, uh, so I'm now going to introduce Dennis uh, Queen from uh, Manchester, who's going to talk to us about disability, the history of disability arts um, in the UK. Uh, take it away, Dennis. Hi, everyone. It's really exciting to meet you all. Um, my name's Mix Dennis Queen. My pronouns are she or anything. Um, I have short brown hair with pale tips. And purple glasses. I'm white and I'm wearing red and black. I live in Manchester in England with my wife and three young disabled people. And, uh, and I'm in my forties and I'm, and I'm transgender. So, um, um, in, in, um, so I've been involved in various kinds of activism, but only since the late 1990s in the disabled people's movement in the UK. Um, I uh, originally got involved through my local coalition of disabled people, which is called Greater Manchester Coalition of Disabled People. And really they trained me up in learning the kind of politics I was gonna need to become an activist. And then I got involved in Dan with Jill, which I absolutely loved because, uh, well, I'm on the autistic spectrum and like not following the rules is just, normal for me so non-violent civil disobedience no problem um so and these days in the last few years i also do sorry i'm also a musician and i do some disability arts and that's mainly what i'm going to talk about today um 
and um, I started doing occasional performances for disabled people's organisations um, around maybe 2001. <clears throat> which I absolutely love to do and I don't get enough of doing because I've not never really had the time to seek much work with the music because one we're always busy with like what feels like such urgent activism but also I was home educating my two youngest children for a lot of the last 10 years so I'm co-chair of disability arts online these days so I, I decided I was old enough that I should take my stint on committees um instead of making everyone else do it all the time. And I also joined the executive committee of my coalition, of Greater Manchester Coalition of Disabled People. And I'm a trustee in our local access group um, and also involved in a few other groups. So um, art's really important to us in Manchester because we've always uh, taken part in doing disability arts. Um, and I guess I'm going to start really by saying what what do I mean by disability arts today in this in this context? So, because arts about disabled people, it goes right back as far as cave paintings and Egyptians made statues of a well-respected statesman who was a small person. So representations of us and our differences exist in art going back a long way, but that's not really what I'm talking about today. So I'm not a kind of art historian as such at all. Um, and I'm also not talking about another kind of disability arts that can be more well known, which is, I don't know, you may get them here, we, there. We get here like things like, um, uh, charity Christmas cards from the Mouth Painters Association, things like that. And that's also not what I'm talking about today when I'm talking about disability arts. So what I am talking about is arts relating to our activism in particular, as well as arts around it about our lives and about our politics and the things that we face as people. Um, and disability arts has been around, that kind of disability arts has been around ever since we started doing political activism. So as various campaigns and actions have happened over many years since the 1970s, so have disabled artists join in. Uh, we've made recordings, writings, we've laughed about, commented, dreamed, drawn, performed, sung, filmed, photographed, and even danced, telling the story about our journey as a community. So I'm a musician and some of the tracks I've written record particular protests that I've been to or events that have happened in our, uh, in, 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 in recent times that are important to us or particular campaigns that are going on. And so do lots of other artists, amazing artists. Um, I feel like, for so our, our art as disabled people, this kind of art can be really quite raw and, and frank and fresh. It can be shocking, it can be soothing, it can be affirming. Our idea of quality in art is quite different because it isn't a who's the best painter of an apple competition. It's really about the messages that we're sharing and the value that that has for how it helps build our community um, and the messages that we're sharing. Um, and as well as being important to develop our artists um, as the individual sharing their talent, it's an important part of our history and it helps record some of that history. So at the moment we've got artists, disabled artists working here in Manchester with the People's History Museum on exhibitions that will be about this disabled people's movement history over here, over there. And it will include as well as lots of sort of ob more obvious political items like, uh, um, I don't know, magazines that people have released and posters, that there's also all kinds of additional art that goes alongside it. Um, and then, and the things that we make, even like campaign t-shirts become kind of part of that arts so we have like dan that um jill was talking about dan has 
some really iconic t-shirts for example that even now we're about to do another print run of um and that in particular is the one that says on the front piss on pity so that one's been very popular and we've done runs of that since the um 1990s i think um so and our yeah how we judge quality is different so what you know what is the message that someone's giving and it might be it's about how we're saying things not about perfection in the ways that others normally see it because this is about our way of judging quality our way of understanding arts and what it means to us as people and and to me sort of disability arts is everything from the stuff that people do who are commissioned that are doing it professionally now to the things that we do at the opposite end of the scale to the the flags and the the um, banners that we make and the placards that we make when we're going on protests and i think everything sort of from one end of the scale to the other is really important and i feel like for activists this kind of arts is like food it's like it's like a kind of fuel it, and it gives us ways to capture our common experiences in a nutshell and dissect it in so many creative ways. It reflects our dreams and campaigns and artists help dream the next step. So at times the artist is recording the activism and at other times the artist is leading the activism, if you see what I mean. It helps us share anger and joy and pride, which has been a really important part of our building as a community helps us reinforce campaign messages that people can sing along to. Like, uh, like there's a song in which Alan Holdsworth, who was in Dan, as mentioned before, has a chant that's in a song that goes proud, angry and strong. So a lot of us know that. So it's also the songs that we might sing on the battlefield, as well as at events later on. And at events, you know, I've done, what I mainly do is cabaret events. So there'll be lots of different performers doing different kinds of disability arts. So I tend to perform myself like with comedians and um, other kinds of musicians, um, dancers, people who are doing small plays, all kinds of different things. Um, and these shows, the shows that we do, the biggest thing I think that's important there is, is it kind of raises morale um, of other disabled people because it kind of reflects what we're doing or doing together. Um, so yeah, when I joined GMCDP um, in around 1998, there was already quite a strong connection to disability arts. So uh, in those days we could still afford regular in-person get togethers um, because as, um, as um, Jill has been saying, since 2010, a lot of organizations had reduced funding and then many of them lost funding so these days there's not quite as many get-togethers and as many cabarets but actually it's it's really important that we still do it as much as we can so like at gmcdp i'll still play if i can if there's an, a, a big meeting that members come to and um and although we've done less arts in recent years in terms of having get-togethers we've developed other ways that cost less money so at christmas we had a our online get-together we had we invited anyone who wanted to to take a turn so um and everyone could have the same amount of time it was five minutes or whatever it was you know no matter whether it was their first time or their millionth time and actually it was hilarious we had a really good time and members asked if we could do that again next year um, and we also have like a new young creatives project going um, through with Manchester Contact Theatre. So that's been one of the things we're doing here. Um, a disability Arts Online, that's quite a big project. I didn't realise when I got involved, it was as big as it was. But what we have is, um, is kind of everything we do is based around a website, but we have gradually built up funding and we do commissions. So we've been able to give quite a lot of work to disabled artists um, and we employ several staff and we have a remote office. So that's another space where it's been that we can sort of partly track what's been going on. I've just realized how late it is. Gosh, time jumps fast, doesn't it? I'm just gonna, um, what I wanted to do was share some links with you 
where you can learn a lot more detail about these things I'm skimming over. So I'm just going to cut and paste that into the chat. So what we have here is a history of disability from a disability arts perspective. I think they mean, yeah, sorry. And um, that's one thing. So that's within the Disability Arts Online website, which is the organisation that I co-chair. But also there's a link to what's been called the National Disability Arts Collection Archive. And that is developing a website, uh, giving us lots of images and other formats of things to show us about um, the history of the kind of arts that I'm talking about today. And what I would say is for any projects we're doing, there's always ways we can find to get arts a little bit involved. And if you can, it's often a great way for people to join in that don't always find writing their way to join in or don't always find long meetings their way to join in. There's lots of other people who will join in with disability arts and it's a great way to participate, especially in the beginning. So I think that's probably all I've got to say. But if anyone wants to talk further about any of this at any point, please just get in touch because Pada can put you in touch with me, I think, if that's all right, Pada. And lovely to meet you all. Thanks a million, Dennis. And yeah, I will happily pass on any uh, people who want to get in touch with you. So I think because we're running over slightly, I'm not, uh, yeah, I mean, it's my fault since I ran over with mine. I was completely ignoring the time to be honest. So um, I think we said, yeah. Um, so we're going to change it up just a little. We're going to have a five minute break um, and then we're going to come back for a shorter conversation and then we're maybe um, uh, 10 minutes at most, uh, 10 minutes or um, so, and then we are going to go into a Q&A um, before wrapping up. So, uh, welcome back everyone. We're going to go into a brief conversation and then we are going to go to your questions and answers. Uh, Please uh, use the raise hand function when we come to the Q&A and um, Miriam and our Alan will spotlight, will, spot, will, will inform me if your hand is raised because I probably won't be able to see it. Um, and then we will get to your question. But for, uh, just before that, we are going to do a brief conversation between those three panellists. So I guess I want to open with, um, yeah, I think both... I think both of you, Joel and Dennis, have alluded to the fact that a lot of UK organisations um, have both a history and direct action, and but also um, struggle with for, to maintain funding. Now, I know DMCDP has been around for um, well over thirty for, for over thirty years. Um, so it's something we're wondering as a new kind of fledgling DPO with Disability Power Ireland. Um, like, uh, yeah, it's something we, like, we're, we're asking ourselves, like, as a committee, like, how do we, how do we best do this with, what's the best way to balance, like, be non-violent civil disobedience, but also try and um, get funding so we can actually sustain ourselves as a DPO, or do you think that's incompatible, do you think those um, aspirations are kind of incompatible and do we have to kind of choose one? Or, um, yeah, what would you two say to that? I think that's partly why DAM was formed, because we needed a separate entity that was less liable, that could yeah. get along with certain things. And that hopefully Jill can say more about this in a second. But it meant then organisations like the Greater Manchester Coalition and the other coalitions that we had, we were tending to go for local funding that would deal with our core funding. So back when we had local authority core funding, um, we had bigger offices, we had more staff, all of that stuff. Um, but um, since that dried up, when the council started having less money to throw around, um, that's when it got difficult. But in a way, that's why we needed Dan, because Dan was a network, it wasn't an organization. It didn't have a board or a committee or anything like that. So that it didn't have the liability that organize, other organizations like GMCDP would have had if we did protests. And, and that's not to say GMCDP didn't protest. They just don't usually do nonviolent civil disobedience. But what they have done 
for years is supported Dana's to go on Dan Actions. So that's how I managed to go on most of the Dan Actions I went on um, was with their support. But yeah, Jill might have more to say or different to say here. Um, no, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm loath to advise really, but I do think it's probably better, as Dennis says, to keep it separate for those reasons. The other thing is not all disabled people want to take direct action, you know. Um, yeah, and we had, you know, good relationships with British Council of Organisations of Disabled People, and there were great people doing great things in those organisations. Um, and it is, it's very much about a different way of working. I mean, the other thing is, and it's interesting, Dennis just mentioned that the Greater Manchester Coalition did use to take action, did use to protest, and actually some of that maybe, you know, did, did veer into direct action, actually. Um, you know, but it would depend on the work and depend if that was something that had come up through the work of that organisation, I guess. So, you know, it's a, you never rule it out, but I guess it's, it's just deciding what's the aim of your organisation and what are you wanting to do? And, you know, are you wanting to provide advice and services and support to disabled people, to other disabled people? Or are you going to want to be something else, you know? Um, yeah, you've got a good title, so it could go in any direction, really, with power in the title. That's fantastic. Um, but yeah, I, it depends what you want your organisation to do, really. Um, I also think, um, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot recently about, you know, just about taking direct action and what that means now. And is it the same as it used to be? Um, and again, what does that mean for both disabled people, the disabled people's movement, and what does it mean for organisations? Um, you know, because I think some of the things that we used to do would, yeah, maybe not be as effective for various reasons. I think, you know, we did have a lot of the time, not all the time, a lot of the time we'd have a good chunk of the public on our side, not everybody. Sometimes people complain about being held up for a bit. I think now if you block traffic, you know, for five minutes, blimey, people would come over and thump you probably. Um, and, you know, and so it's wondering how effective that is. I don't know, and that's a whole other debate. And of course now, you know, we were, you know, when I was in Dan, it was way before um, social media. So, you know, you can, you can have effective campaigns on social media and some of those, campaigns can be run more effectively that way. So there's whole debates about, you know, how, yeah, what does direct action mean now? Yeah, I mean, that's um, uh, over here, the Green and Black Cross, I don't know if they work in Ireland as well. They are offering training for activists in understanding what the new police powers that we're facing are going to mean. Um, and I'm booked in for that, I think, next week or the week after to try and bring that back to other people in local DPAC and Dan. But the last time I was arrested doing non-violent civil disobedience, I got charged. Uh, oh, they charged me with being a public nuisance, which is this charge that they now want to make easier to convict on. Because um, they basically they couldn't charge me with obstructing the public highway because I was on a tram line and I pointed out to them that it was privately owned. So, so it's not a public highway in fact, but then they just, they arrest you for something worse. So that was, I got off, I got off in the end because the judge couldn't believe it went to the, the Crown Court. Um, and I couldn't understand how it even ended up in front of her and I was found not guilty. Um, but it, it was an expensive process, and so I don't have out-of-work benefits, so we get no legal aid, and that cost, it ran into over a £1,000. So it, it, we also need to know what, it, what are the costs of arrests, what are the charges, and, and, and <laughs> are they likely to make an example of us? Because also, in the beginning, when Dan... So I've met... In recent years, I've met Danners that I didn't know that were there in early Dan days that weren't still there when I came into Dan. And during the time I was in Dan, you didn't actually, it, it went from, from being in a situation where you basically have to do something they could arrest you for before they could arrest you. And not needing, for you not needing to have done anything arrestable yet for them to arrest you, which was a big change. And 
um, since then they've done further and further changes ending up where we are now so it, it is a really important consideration they probably are going to make examples of some people um, and we need to know what the consequences are going to be for disabled people whether we can face arrest because not everyone can afford to go through court not everyone can cope but, uh, and also just to be fair like Jill said arrest is not a name that's the thing as well the reason we talk about arrest is because it's one of the things that gets us more attention is if people are arrested but at the same time we don't actually want anybody to be arrested because it costs money it's not nice you know being in the, in the jail cells it's not nice if you've got mental health problems which which I do basically for the first half hour I'm like yeah f you I don't care and then I remember I absolutely hate it and then I cry for the next seven hours until they let me go so you've got to be prepared for it being quite tough in there and also that um they, you might not have the support you need so we've had deaf people having not having the interpreters they need but anyway um yeah so I, I just wanted to say there are so many things to consider what is the law now so when Dana's first joined you had to really do something before you could get arrested and the police did not know what to do with disabled people yeah when Dana's tell that story now uh, um unfortunately the younger Dana's have to come back and go oh no love they don't care believe me they didn't care eight of them picked me up and flung me in the back of a van when they nicked me in 2017 in Manchester they are not remotely scared of arresting us. They arrest disabled people every day, often people who are in distress. And so it's not, you know, it's it's a very different playing field. So I think it's like important to find out if if your group wants to do protest, find out what, what can be done with legal protests and then also find out, you know, what is the lay of the land at the moment for other activists who do that kind of direct action if you want to do something more extreme like civil disobedience. Sorry, I think I'll probably talk too long there, but... No, that was good. That was a really, yeah, really important point, really, really important point. Yeah, it is, you know, any, any, I don't know, you know, goodwill that was around in the 90s towards disabled protesters. Well, that's long gone now. That's long gone now. Another, yeah, that's important, another important consideration is benefits. Everybody's, everything's on camera now. People are taking photos and videoing stuff. So that could land you also in trouble with benefits. Somebody, uh, you know, you're not fit for work, yet you're out on the street protesting, you know. Yeah, the Department for Work and Pensions could be on your back about that, and that's a real worry for a lot of people as well. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, I don't think Ireland's laws are quite as authoritarian yet when it comes to arresting, but we're probably getting there, especially because, um, yeah, our, our Minister for Justice, um, I think, is a bit authoritarian. It's hard to tell because she's part of a political party that usually frames itself as being part of the party of law and order, but she, um, I think she has leadership ambitions, so I don't know if, if, if that happens, it might be a... Interesting. Uh, interesting, I'd be mean, terrified. So, uh, but, uh, um, I don't know, I guess that would lead me on to my, uh, yeah, my, uh, yeah, I mean, what's so, I don't know, what do you think is the best, what what, what hope do you think there is for the f future? I realise that's um, kind of a broad point, because I mean, in the UK situation, I have some first-hand experience of it myself, is not good, and uh, Ireland is not really good either. Like we 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 get ignored, and uh, like I don't know. People tell us to go to the legal channels, like, but then you then you read stories like Irish politicians don't show up to committees and stuff in the all if they're at the, at the Irish Parliament. Um, if they're related to disability, they it's been shown that they actually just go somewhere else. Or so, um, it's basically it's not an electoral issue. I mean, even as I said in my talk Ireland signed the UN CRPD but we didn't actually sign the optional protocol so we can't actually legally challenge the government internationally as a consequence of that so I don't know like what's the what's the I don't know what like how do you how do you keep yourself optimistic I guess um, in the UK as a movement because if you don't want to if because the because direct action can be terrifying but also to legal but then legally challenging but I think that's the yeah. thing about this direct action, or, you know, about that. Well, it's not just damn at all, not just direct action. Where, where, you know, where I have hope is 
in communities, in networks, in networks of like-minded people, in, you know, however you define those communities and where your networks and support come from. Because obviously it's very hard to have hope in political systems at the moment, I think. Um, but, you know, I think that's where the hope is, more grassroots, more community stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's what I'm saying, you know, Dan was great for that. It wasn't just about the action. Obviously, you know, it was, it was a massive source of support. Uh, it's a really strong network. Of people, but that's formed in other organisations and in other ways amongst disabled people as well. And some of that's online, of course. Some of that's a really good source of support. So I think you know, yeah, there's still there's, there is hope, but I think I, I find it more there. Uh, and Dennis, yeah, I think well, a few things give me hope. One is there's only so much work it can get. And uh, and I wonder if it's deliberate that we're being pushed down so that we can stay now in a cycle of scrabbling for the same crumbs back, right? Um, what the, the positive side is that actually, you know, as oh, several things happened in the, the whole movement, as it, I, when I entered the movement in the late 90s, it was shrinking a bit. Um, we had lost people, people had died. Um, it's always been hard bringing in new younger people. That's always been an issue. Then it was an issue. Then it is now. Um, but what, the thing that does give me hope is that that I hate to say this, as to some extent, some people had their needs met, and it meant activism got more gentle. I don't want to say it in any more critical a way than that. But I unfortunately once said, you know. Maybe if everyone lost their DLA tomorrow, we'd start seeing people out on the streets because we were finding it really hard getting people out to protest, even when approaching 2010 in Dan's final protests, trying to stop the government from making the benefit changes it was going ahead to make anyway. Um, and um, it was so hard to get anyone out at all. And then, unfortunately, people started getting massively shit on. You know, they all suddenly lost loads of benefits. And, but what it has done is meant that we're starting to come together again more because we need each other. And, I, and that is the positive side of it. So it is a shame we're having to come together, but it's good that we are coming together. And I think one of the lessons we need to learn for next time is that we can't take our foot off the pressure. We can't take the pressure off our foot, you know, because the minute you get something, they start trying to knock it out from underneath you. And so... It's about, I guess, how we what we do this time is how we keep that running so that we keep our momentum up once it's going well. Um, I don't know if I've got the answer to it, but, but the hopefulness is that we we are seeing the movement grow because out of need, basically. And if what we have got also, the other hope I have is that I think, I mean, I might be biased because I'm a parent, so I have three children there. Uh, one's 25 and the other two are 17. And, you know, the young people of this generation, I'm telling you something, they are not stupid. These kids have had the world's largest encyclopedia in their own hand, in their own pocket, since eight years old. This generation is changing. They're becoming more themselves. They're getting confident. And I do have some real hope in the future. But what we've got to do is make sure we're still reaching out to those young disabled people as much as possible and bringing them and their amazing skills in. Because, you know, maybe they've got the answers that we don't have yet. And mm. that's, they're so powerful. When I went on the school's protests, I was absolutely amazed. I saw in Manchester hundreds of children un unplanned take out the same tram lines I'd taken out with really experienced Danners on a DPAC protest just a few years before. None of them knew what they were doing. They didn't have any bus cards. They had nothing. And you know what? They didn't give, they didn't care. And they were so powerful and confident. And I think my hope is in, in these young people. It really is. Yeah, I, I think that's a good place. Um, I think that's an optimistic note to um, end the conversation on. We're just going to go to a quick, uh, to some questions and answers from our audience. Um, Again, if you want to leave a question, uh, if you want to leave a question or a comment, if you want, um, you can either put it in the, if you don't want to speak, you can put it as a written comment or in the chat, 
our, our question in the chat, but if you want to speak, uh, please re use the raise hand function. Um, so we'll just give them a few minutes to see if, um, Alan or Miriam, if you could just tell me. I, I'd just like to put my hand up. Uh, I can't do it manually, so I'm just doing it verbally. Uh, yeah, 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 go ahead, yeah. Um, yeah, like with the, but just to thank you very much for uh, Disability Power Ireland for uh, hosting this tonight. It's been very fascinating. And in particular, thanks to the brilliant guests, including yourself, Padder, and to Dennis, and to, I'm afraid I forget the lady's name from Leeds. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, I love the uh, art. Jill. Jill, sorry. Yeah, no, but it's great. Um, but thank you very much. You know, it's, it, it's fascinating. But uh, my question is about the DPO movement. Now, we have a big quango in Ireland. They employ 40 people called the National Disability Authority. They're no more, they're, they're not really an, an authority, but they've been given that advisory role for the last 20 years or more, 23 years. But the thing is, they had a report on DPOs back in 2020 and they cited Britain as being one of the countries where DPOs, the whole thing had failed because the service providers had completely taken over that space. And I'm just wondering, I mean, we're trying to, I, I should have introduced, say like, uh, I, I was one of the co-founders of Voice of Vision Impairment in 2019 and it is our goal to be a DPO that will get ultimate DPO rights under the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. But it really is, um, the horror story is what happened in Britain. So the British government is hardly ever, uh, from what we know, involves DPOs in, in consultations and their default is to prioritise the service providers. Like in our case, it would be our equivalent would be the RNIB over there and the Irish equivalent would be the NCBI here, charities. Sorry, that's my question over now. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody. Uh, sorry, can I, who, are, who are you I mean that at, Robbie? Just so I know for clarification. Oh, yeah. Oh, my name is uh, Robbie Sinis. Uh, no, 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 no. But who, who are you I mean the question at? Who would you like to oh, answer? Oh, at, at anybody. At, at, oh, sorry, yeah. at, at, especially Dennis and Jill uh, being in England. Yeah, but okay. Pat, um, if, you'd like to, if you'd like to also put in your whatever you think as well, that'd be uh, great. I mean, I will just answer very briefly. Yes, I have views about the National Council of the Blind Ireland. I have a lot of views, but um, and also the RNIB subsequently, and their views overlap quite a bit, and they are not positive. But um, so, yeah. But um, no, uh, Dennis or Joe, do you want to take that one? Um, oh, sorry, I, I uh, it's interesting that there's actually been that report that's saying, oh, you know, yeah, the, the DPO experiment has failed. You know, we don't need these organisations of disabled people for whatever reasons. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I'd be interested. I'd be quite interested to read it, actually. I remember there was um, a centre integrated living or a centre for independent living in Essex, I think, that, you know, the, that they asked their members who were disabled people whether they thought it was important that the organisation remained under the control of disabled people. And obviously there's ways and ways of asking questions like that of people, aren't there? And of course, you know, and people said, no, we're not really bothered, really. We're not really bothered if this stays an organisation of disabled people. So there's that going on as well. And certainly, um, you know, that, that service provision has really confuse the picture at least uh, you know yeah and, and done for a lot of disabled people's organizations because that's where all their efforts gone and that's where the money is you know and you end up chasing money that isn't really your core business but that's the money you're gonna get um yeah i mean maybe it's interesting uh, sorry dennis putting you on the spot you know to hear, because you're involved in greater manchester coalition of disabled people which I'm sure things have been really difficult for you. Outside of Manchester, we always think, yeah, GMCDP is still going strong. I don't know what it's like from the inside. Well, I mean, we, we've we've hung in there by the skin of our teeth, but funding-wise, it's been a struggle. And it's partly because of that. Manchester, Greater Manchester Coalition 
uh, resisted becoming a service provider. It's a discussion we've had many times and our politics is that we refuse to do that because it's more than one reason. One of them is because you're too easy to take over by someone who's actually can do it faster. Um, and the second, the second reason is we didn't believe, or this is at least is what I understood, you know, going back to the first times I heard this conversation in the 90s. We didn't believe it was right that we should have to provide the services. We just felt the services had to be right. And that in, in, does in, involve including us, but it doesn't mean we have to do the work. So what we focused on here instead was campaigning for our local authorities to do that job properly. So to make sure that proper social care was happening, to make uh, so we make sure we had a direct payments team, for example, and things like that. So we chose to take that approach, um, but it was, it was yeah, partly a political decision and partly one around the fact that we knew we'd, we'd end up cornered. Um, so we have projects, but we don't provide services as such. And we have to be, we have to think hard sometimes about where that line is even. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, Alan or Miriam, could you please tell me, does anybody else have their hand up? Hi, Peter. Yeah, uh, Peter's next. Okay, uh, Peter, go. He might be having some difficulty on muting there. Yeah. No. Uh, Sorry, I was <laughs> unmuted there. Uh, my name is Peter Gohery. I'm the chairman of Physical Impairment Ireland. Uh, we're a new group that's set up here. We're through DPO uh, organization. But I, I think the biggest thing I think here in Ireland, I think we all need to stick together. You know, every disabled person's organization, maybe come under one big umbrella and everyone start driving the message. Like Leo there is our secretary. He's on the group there tonight. I see his hand up as well. Um, but like asking questions and not getting answers to them, I think is totally unfair of our politicians today. You know, they have an onus, they have a duty of care to us, uh, you know, to come back, answer those questions. And I see even asking, the, you know, local TDs, asking them a simple question. They were in at different meetings and a year later, when you'd meet them and you'd ask, why didn't you respond to us or return, you know, come back to us on what you've seen at the meeting? And they have the cheek to say, oh, I didn't know I had to come back. Well, why stay writing in front of us, uh, letting us believe that you were coming back to us? I think it's an absolute joke what's going on with them. They don't seem to have a count on anything. And I suppose the other thing which you see going on in Ireland, sorry, I'm not used to what goes on in England. Uh, or Britain, uh, but like what I see in, in here in Ireland, like kind of is asking able-bodied people what we want is a total joke. You know, it should be us that they should be talking to all the way forward. It's more a comment to have, and I'm sorry. Um, look, I'd like to thank the other sister, Robbie, there for coming on, you know, as well with us, always giving us uh, guidance on where we're at and what we're doing. So thanks a million for everything, all right? Um, yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I, okay, I'll, I'll respond just very briefly to that. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, as I said in my thing, I think, yeah, politi it's been shown that politicians don't show up to committee meetings um, in the parliament if they're about disability or uh, talks. That, I mean, uh, that's obviously not, true for all politics. Like, I think opposition party politicians tend to be at least a little better at it, and even they aren't great, but they at least nominally send one or two people, but the government parties don't even pretend. So yeah, you're right, there's a huge... I, I mean, I don't. I think like the House of Commons, the Dáil or the Irish Parliament Assembly basically is not wheelchair accessible. Now, I've only been in the Dáil once, so I can't, I'm not a wheelchair user as well, so I can't really comment on that. But if anybody wants to maybe put that in chat to contradict it. If I'm wrong about that, just tell me, because I don't know, but I don't think it's wheelchair accessible. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a fair bit. 
that's a basic thing compared to everything else, but it still it shows the lack of it shows the mentality really. Um, it shows the mentality. There's just that there's everything. There's a war when you try to communicate with the political class, um, and it's exhausting. Okay, I'm cognizant. I don't want to hold people all night, but yeah. I think maybe um, if we take one more um, question, if we take one more question, yeah. um, as a member of the first board of people with disabilities, uh, uh, I was I stood raising issues back in the nineties and uh, was part of the first board. Uh, so we went on many delegations to Leinster House and went down um, the Minister's Row. And yes, um, it was difficult getting in um, uh, into the Doyle and uh, the lift upstairs was difficult to, to reach uh, and stuff like that. Uh, but yes, things have improved. We've had many a committee meeting in, um, in, uh, in Leinster House and stuff like that uh, over the years. Uh, but... Uh, of the 402 recommendations for the Commission for the States of People with Disabilities in 1995, 16 were implemented out of uh, 22, and then they undid everything they did, uh, and they haven't yet reinstated. So the whole principle of the rights-based approach of uh, participation, decision-making, um, uh, consultation, by people with disabilities as service users and advocates, not service providers that tell us what we need to do and how we have to do it, run by parents and professionals and uh, uh, and uh, public services and stuff like that. Uh, uh, you know, it's very much something that we need to stress. Now, we when they decided to defund people with disabilities in Ireland Limited, we got our senators to ask the ministers the Justice Minister and the Disability Equality Minister, if we could continue to coordinate the members and networks and groups without funding. And stupidly, they said yes on record in the Shannon. So uh, that's why we re 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 launched and rebranded as National Council of People with Disabilities. So we had no funding whatsoever in all of the years. Um, uh, my disability allowance is the sole money of 98% of our expenditure. And I can do this because I'm the grandson of Belgian resistance leaders and my social welfare is backdated to 1st of January 1985 and they get 110,000 euro a year. And if there's any problems, I can go to the, uh, to the ministers and the officials in their Belgium and get uh, things done over their heads. Uh, but I shouldn't have to do this. Uh, but I couldn't get an Irish passport. And I saw it as an opportunity, the fact that... Um, uh, um, Despite being able to vote as an Irish citizen after I was naturalised, the paperwork disappeared. Not a problem. I basically went over the heads and around them and uh, they tried to take our children off us and everything, but they couldn't do so. So we got laws changed and, uh, and forced changes and forced access to services by going over the top of them. But we shouldn't have to do so. Uh, so we're standing up for the rights of, of consultation, participation, decision making at all levels of government, state and public funded bodies. OK, thank Nothing you. About us, without us, of, for, run and controlled by majority of us. Yeah. OK. Uh, thank you, Dermot. Yes, I totally agree. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's frustrating that the parliament, even when they do make recommendations, that they ignore them. OK. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to take one more quick, if anybody has a very quick uh, question, especially for Joe or Dennis, because I'm cognizant that I've just responded to comments for the last two. So if you have a very quick question that you could ask um, that, I, that you think might have a short answer, um, can you yes, ask please. it now? Um, hi. Hello, Who's this? Yeah. My yeah. name is Leo. And Hi, Leo. I'm, um, the aforementioned Leo, who's the National Secretary of Physical Impairment Ireland. Yeah. Um, I was speaking with a member of Parliament today, actually, here in Ireland, in relation to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the optional protocol. This lady told me straight out that our government are absolutely scared, you know what, of ratifying the optional protocol because they feel that it will bankrupt our country. Like we have had issues since Adam was a little boy, let's say in this country with people with disabilities. You um, highlighted some of them, the basically um, the 
abuse uh, that was highlighted in the Ryan Commission Commission to inquire into child abuse and the effects of people from the years 1936 to um, in or around 1999. A horrific report that was eventually published in 2009. It's basically still known as Ireland's Holocaust because that's basically what they did. But like, I'd like to get um, maybe Dennis and Jill, how do you feel? Do you feel that if the optional protocol of the United Nations Convention was um, ratified, will it bankrupt our lovely little country? Thank you. Uh, Dennis, do you want to go? I don't, I don't know because I don't know. I don't know about the banking arrangements in that way, but what I what I would say is I think um, a lot of us here are also fighting to try and get the UN CRPD. I hope I got those in the right order. Um, various things within that ratified, like we're, we're doing um, consultations about education at the moment, and a lot of what we're pushing for is those same recommendations. So I mean. Will it bankrupt a country? I don't know. I don't know what you spend your money on over here. They spend a lot of money on things that we'd rather they didn't and things that maybe we don't need and maybe things that we shouldn't do that I think some of us are quite be happy to take the budget away from. Um, exactly. Yeah. If they, exactly. if they wanted to make the money, they'd make it, you know, make exactly. it better. Exactly. Money, money can be found, can't it, for all sorts of things, whether that's, you know, good things like, yeah. Anyway, yeah. During COVID, a lot of money was found from heaven knows where immediately, you know. Yeah, it's about priorities, isn't it? Of course, it wouldn't bankrupt a country for pity's sake. And, you know, how can you talk in those terms when you're talking about people's lives and people's potential anyway, and how much money is lost there because that potential isn't being realised? It'd be a better question. Yeah, so I'll just briefly um, respond as well just before we, uh, and then I will close out. So, yeah, so back in the 90s, I'm going to, this is a short story, I promise it's relevant. Back in the 90s, it was about our, our lovely government back then, um, as opposed to the lovely government we have now. Um, anyway, um, announced that they were going to build a big phallic symbol in the middle of Dublin called the Spire. It is now. I wish I could show you photos of this, but look it up on Google. It is now the, it, yes, that. Yeah, but yeah, it's called this. Yeah, anyway, it's a big metal phallic symbol. It costs, I don't know the exact amount, but it costs a lot. I, it, I think it was into the millions. Um, anyway, it literally has no point whatsoever. And it, anyway, the government basically, the logs, I think you could guess what a moral is going. The government found money to put a big giant phallic metal symbol in the middle of Dublin. Um, they said it was going to be a tourist attraction. I have never actually spoken to a tourist ever who has ever remote, re remarkably remote um, commented on its artistic merits. Um, it is useful, though, as a, actually a place. If you come to Dublin, it is practically useful if you want to find some as a meeting place because it's so phallic and obnoxiously big and hard to miss. So, But, um, but the point is, yeah. Um, I mean, and also Ireland is a part of the European Union. So, um, like... We are supposedly one of the wealthiest countries in the world, so um, allegedly, I don't know why we keep getting put at the top of those lists, but I think my response would be, even hypothetically, if the optimal protocol did bankrupt our country, which I don't believe it would, I would say that we deserve to be bankrupt, because obviously the government's calculation is that there will be a lot of human rights lawsuits taken against them based on the fact that they're committing chronic human rights abuses against disabled people. The fact that they know this and they, they don't do anything indicates that criminal incompetence at the very least or criminal malice at the very worst. So I would say a country that knows this and refuses to act in advance to preempt this possibly deserves to be bankrupt. Maybe think about that. Um, but I don't believe the optimal protocol would bankrupt the country, and I, I don't. Yeah, and it was a huge, it was a huge kind of, it was a huge bittersweet moment when, we, when the CRPD was ratified. But then it was kind of under immediately, immediately under culture with the refusal to ratify the um, 
the optional protocol. So yeah, okay, guys, um, I've kept you way over time. Um, I'm sorry for that, but I hope you've learned something. Valuable. The druggie's needle is behind me now. If anybody wants to have a see of it, uh, I did it from screenshot from uh, Google Maps in while you were talking. Um, Alan, can you uh, briefly spot spotlight it, please? I can forward it on by uh, email to somebody if they want. Uh, yeah, that also works. Okay. Or you can uh, get it yourself uh, from Google yeah. Maps. Uh, okay. Just look up the Spire, Connell Street, Dublin. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's hard to. I actually I only live ten minutes away from it. It's uh, embarrassing, but anyway. Um, but yeah, as I said, no. But yeah, my point with this is yeah. Um, okay, but yeah. Okay. That's, so uh, I only can... I only put it up uh, because um, um, Nelson's uh, column uh, ended up uh, in, uh, in uh, the shop across, uh, and that was embarrassing. Yeah, when yeah. It, when, it, when it was blown up, like yeah, yeah. Okay, but yeah, that's true. Okay, so thank you everybody for coming. Um, I hope you have had a great time. Uh, thank you for our great speakers, Joe Crawshaw and Dennis Queen. Thank you for our wonderful technical support, Alan and Miriam Madani, who is also the wonderful chair who is organising this festival from uh, Disability Power Ireland. It is the fest it's the Pride Festival uh, that we are doing events. This is one of a series in a series of events to go thrown throughout the uh, the month. Miriam is kind of spearheading everything. So it's kind of uh, to her credit that events like this and the other ones take uh, place. So uh, yeah, uh, thank you all.